hey, this is Skepen. The new 12.9 inch fifth generation iPad Pro is a powerful yet controversial model in the typically safe and conservative iPad line. I've been using it to draw, edit photos and create videos for the past month and wanted to give my thoughts on this device and whether it's good for digital creators. Right off the bat, I wanted to address the screen blooming issues. Some users have reported a faint glow in contrast these scenes with the new mini LED display. Even when trying to purposely recreate this blooming issue I've seen online, the effect isn't very pronounced and considering most people don't read white text on black pages in a dark room with the tablet at full brightness, it probably won't be an issue for you on most days. In fact, this display gets very dim and still looks great at the lowest settings, so those that do like to read in a dark room should find this beneficial. One screen issue that I did encounter was a faint shadow around the edge of the display. It's something that only really comes up when using an app that has a light interface. Even then, it's not particularly noticeable, especially when you're actually working. Even if you do experience unwanted issues, Apple support has always been very good, and it's very likely that you would be able to exchange your iPad. Since we are talking about the screen, I'm sure you're wondering whether it's actually beneficial to digital artists or not. In drawing apps like Procreate and Clip Studio Paint, I found that using a pencil brush felt more realistic with rich contrast and the tonality between dark and light felt very natural. When applying a lot of pressure while drawing, I did actually have some flex in the screen, but a display this large is going to naturally have a little bit more play compared to something smaller. But the real strengths of this screen come when viewing photos or videos. Again, here we see a lot of very rich contrast and photos and videos look very lifelike, especially when viewing very high quality ones. The colors are accurate and the pixel density contributes to the realistic look of photos. I was actually pretty surprised to see photos I had taken of familiar locations and people look so lifelike. It's really nice to see more color accurate, high quality screens out there on mobile devices. I'm not a display expert and I didn't do any in-depth testing for this screen, but honestly, when it comes to non-creative work like word processing or productivity tasks, you probably won't be able to tell the difference between this display and the last year's display. But for those that do color accurate or HDR work, this iPad might actually be a great value. It can easily double as an excellent secondary screen or even a monitor for your camera. Color accurate HDR monitors aren't cheap, so it's a great addition if you're a creative person looking for a secondary screen. There are plenty of great ways to connect your iPad to your Mac or PC, and whether it's a digitizer for drawing or a secondary screen for color correction, you can't go wrong with this display. I've been very happy using the Liquid Retina XDR display as a secondary screen to support my photo and video workflows on desktop. In fact, for some of my photo work, I'd feel very comfortable just using Lightroom on the iPad. Photo editing is a task that's fairly easy to do with Touch or the Apple Pencil, and with my main photo editing software being Lightroom, which is available on iPads, I can definitely see myself using the new M1 iPad Pro for various photo projects, especially those that demand a quick turnaround. The USB-C port is lightning fast, to the point that you probably don't have a drive or card reader that can take advantage of it yet, which made batch exporting and importing very quick. You can also see the fifth generation iPad Pro's power with LumaFusion. 4K video playback was very smooth, and only at around 6K do things start to get choppy. That's a pretty incredible thing to say if we were talking about a mid-level workstation computer. Even my mini iTex workstation back here struggles with 6K, so to get this kind of performance out of a small tablet is really amazing. With that kind of power, 2D artists, even those using desktop level apps, are going to see diminishing returns, while complicated photo and video editing workflows still aren't easy to achieve. Whether it's the lack of pro level apps or the lack of ports, and expensive storage, it may be difficult for creators to switch over to iPads completely. Things are constantly improving though, and if you understand the limitations of the iPad and have a very specific workflow that's mobile oriented, I think you could take advantage of the 12.9 inch iPad Pro and use it as a mobile workstation. As an artist that lives in a big city, I'm constantly on the go, and I really do enjoy taking my work with me whenever I get the chance. The 12.9 inch iPad Pro is more portable than say my mini ITX workstation, but it's not necessarily my favorite device to use while on the go. Using it as a slate, say on public transportation, is a bit awkward, and it's definitely overkill for light work such as sketching or word processing. It's only when you get a chance to sit down that the iPad Pro can be put to its full potential with the use of some accessories, of course. Even with all that power, without some essential accessories, the iPad's not going to be very productive. There's no integrated solution for a good drawing angle or viewing angle, so for most kinds of work you're going to need either a case or a stand. Even then, without a keyboard, mouse, SD card reader, and other essential accessories, most creative professionals won't be able to get much work done with just the iPad alone. Once you start to pack your bag with not just the iPad, but other accessories that you need for work, you'll find that the once small and sleek iPad gets a lot more bulky and your bag starts to get a lot more heavy. Apple's own Magic Keyboard accessory case seems like it would be an ideal solution for this, but it only adds one USB-C port while adding a lot more bulk and weight. While the case does provide a nice viewing angle for photo and video editors, disappointingly for artists, it has a hard stop well before a 
uncomfortable drawing angle. The lack of ports on a pro device like this can be really frustrating too. After setting up your workstation at a cafe, only to realize that the iPad doesn't have a headphone jack can really waste your whole afternoon. The tablet or two-in-one form factor should in theory allow you to do all kinds of different work in a small form factor, but if your workflow requires the use of several dongles and accessories, it really introduces a lot more points of failure, and in general, it just becomes cumbersome. Other than that, the battery life did leave me a bit worried on days I forgot to bring my charger, presumably because the mini LED display requires more power than the previous model's display. And also at the time of this review, the iPad seems to be limited to 5 gigs of RAM on third-party apps, regardless of which model you purchased. It seems like possibly with the next OS update, developers will be able to take advantage of the available RAM, but at the moment, apps are already very well optimized and I feel like until we see some desktop-grade software available on iPads, they won't be able to take full advantage of the 8 or 16 gigs of RAM, so this shouldn't be a major deciding factor when it comes to this iPad. For me, still the major make-or-break decision point for this iPad should be whether you can work within iPadOS's limitations and if the apps that you need to work are available. With M1 coming to iPads, a lot of creators were hoping to see an improved OS, as well as access to desktop-grade software. Apple still seems reluctant to give iPads this level of complexity. Even if we do see some cross-compatibility, I don't know if it's going to make the iPad the perfect mobile device. With M1, we did see Macs get access to iPad apps, and it wasn't perfect. The language that we use to interface with desktop and mobile apps is just very different, and that often makes it difficult to use apps made for one device on a different type of device. Running desktop apps on iPads with screen mirroring apps shows just how frustrating it can be due to a lack of touch gestures and cramped interfaces. But when those desktop apps are tweaked for mobile, we can see just how much of a game changer it could be with the likes of Lightroom and Clip Studio Paint. For those who use desktop Photoshop or DaVinci Resolve, which have been optimized and performed well on the M1 chip, it can be bittersweet owning a product that theoretically can run the software but doesn't have access to it. But there is some good news. As developers start to update or make new software optimized for the M1 chip, we might see some of those come to iPads in a much more timely manner. So if you're a digital creator, should you pick up one of these fifth generation iPad Pros? If M1 doesn't bring along a paradigm shift for app development or iPad OS, then the only really new feature is the mini LED display. If you approach the new fifth generation iPad Pro from the mindset of a capable tablet that can double as a great color accurate second monitor, it can be a great deal. But it also depends on your work and your workflow. If you don't do color accurate work, then the previous model should be just as good of a value, if not better. I picked up the fifth generation iPad Pro because I wanted a nice drawing tablet, a color accurate second monitor and I didn't already own an iPad of this size, so it was a win-win. For those that already own an iPad that's working for them, I'd say it's not worth rushing out to get this mini LED display. iPads have always had a very good display, this one is just that much better. For 2D artists, it's a fantastic tablet, but probably overkill. If your work involves many layers, it needs to be color accurate, and in general you have an intense workflow, then paying more for this model could be beneficial. But most 2D artists won't be able to take advantage of the power in the screen and would be better off saving some money and buying an older model. Photographers specifically Lightroom users on the other hand will definitely benefit from the mini LED display and even the fast USB-C port for importing photos. I could see in some cases a casual photographer having this as their only photo editing device. In general, if I could only have one machine for photo editing, I would still choose a proper computer. The overall price to performance ratio is better and you have access to a proper OS with more functionality and more storage options. But if you already have a workstation and you're looking for a secondary supplementary device, this iPad could be a great choice. When you aren't using it as an excellent secondary display, it's perfectly capable of taking on light to moderate even professional photo work on its own. Video editors would also be able to take advantage of the mini LED display, but I still find it very difficult to do complex video edits on iPads. For me, it comes down to the OS, the apps, and the way that we interact with them. Photo editing and cataloging is a relatively simple process that can easily be done with touch. The Apple Pencil is a great and intuitive tool for drawing, but video editing is a much more demanding and complex task. While drawing and photo skills are more easily transferred to mobile apps, video editing workflows are often unique for each editor, requiring the customization of workspaces and shortcuts that just aren't available on mobile right now. For some simpler projects or as a way to get into video editing, I think this iPad is a great tool, but until iPadOS goes through some changes or we get access to desktop grade apps, editing video on any iPad will still feel like trying to work with one hand tied behind your back. To sum up the new 12.9 inch iPad Pro in a few words, Apple improved upon the already great screen and added a very powerful chip, but still restricts what you can do with it through the App Store. If you can take advantage of the iPad's power and screen with the available apps for your work, then it's a great purchase. If you have even a little bit of doubt that you wouldn't be able to take full advantage of it, I think an older model would suit you just fine. So that's my review of the 12.9 inch 5th generation iPad Pro. I hope you liked the video. If you did, give me a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. I'm always happy to talk about tech or art or anything, so let me know what you think. I'm Tsukaben, and thank you so much for watching.